Hi, I'm Damon Smith, UW Field Crops Extension Pathologist. We're going to talk today about corn disease management. And the first disease we're going to talk about is anthracnose. And anthracnose is caused by the fungus Calitoxicum graminicola. Uh, and the diseases can actually take on three different types uh, when we're dealing with anthracnose. We can have leaf blight, uh, top dieback, and also stalk rot. And yield losses can range from somewhere between 3 and 16 uh, percent uh, on corn here in Wisconsin due to anthracnose. And the disease is mainly driven uh, by weather. Okay, And so here's the disease cycle for anthracnose. And this is a residue-borne pathogen, meaning that the uh, overwintering spores actually survive on old corn residue from the previous crop. And then the uh, spores are actually splashed, uh, uh, dispersed, uh, onto the uh, plants uh, when it rains in the uh, spring and summertime. Uh, it is a poor competitor outside of uh, corn residue, so uh, good rotations or longer rotations between corn crops can help uh, uh, break down that residue and also uh, get rid of some of the uh, spore load uh, that may overwinter. So typically we'll see corn uh, on corn rotations having higher levels of of anthracnose than uh, corn, soybean, uh, and wheat rotation type systems. In terms of uh, other management strategies here, tillage can also be helpful as the residue that lays up on top of the soil surface obviously is very important. And so if we can bury some of that residue uh, through some tillage practices, uh, that can help uh, reduce the amount of spore load out there. I already have talked quite a bit about rotation. In terms of chemical control, uh, seed treatments and also some foliar uh, fungicides could also be useful uh, for uh, combating uh, anthracnose here. Host resistance can also be important, and so studying good hybrid um, uh, trials, uh, looking at uh, varieties that are well adapted to your area, which also have resistance to anthracnose, can be very important. To shift gears to another fungus which causes uh, disease on corn, we have eye spot here and you can see the uh, disease symptoms on a, a corn leaf here in this uh, photo and you can see where it gets its name. It sort of looks like an eyeball uh, with each of these spots here. Uh, the uh, eye spot pathogen uh, can be confused, the symptoms that it produces can be confused with uh, uh, physiological or genetic flecking, which can occur in some hybrids. So you need to be uh, careful and familiar with certain hybrids to be sure you're not actually looking at some sort of genetic uh, disorder there. Uh, these lesions will typically have a red uh, uh, spot in the middle with this yellow halo. And the uh, spores that cause eye spot, uh, uh, the, the fungus that causes eye spot, actually overwinter again in corn residue. The, they are splash dispersed in the spring and summertime as we have our rains up to the plant, and the uh, disease can slowly move up uh, from the uh, bottom side of the plant uh, to the top side of the plant. Uh, cool, wet weather uh, can be very important for the uh, development of eye spot, and so in years where we don't have a lot of uh, heat and dryness, uh, you may see more eye spot, and in the dry years, you may not see any eye spot at all. So it is very dependent on the environment and weather. Uh, management includes rotation, uh, resistant uh, hybrids, and also uh, some foliar fungicides. Northern corn leaf blight is also another uh, uh, pretty common disease for us here in Wisconsin. Uh, it is caused by an Exorilum species uh, and produces typically these cigar-shaped gray, uh, green to uh, somewhat tan colored uh, lesions and these can be about one to six inches long and they can uh, eventually coalesce on a leaf to make a very large lesion. Uh, but when you have this type of lesion with these uh, cigar-shaped uh, ends to it, uh, that's pretty diagnostic for northern corn leaf blight. Also you can have this uh, grayish growth in the center of the lesion, especially when it's wet out in the morning hours. So scouting in the early morning when there's a lot of dew can be helpful because you might be able to see uh, that gray growth in the center of this cigar-shaped lesion. That's actually the spores uh, or the uh, body of the fungus producing spores that have erupted through the uh, surface of the leaf here. These spores are, are again, 
uh, splash uh, dispersed typically from corn residue in the field up onto the leaves of the plant and then as the uh, season progresses it will slowly uh, move up uh, the plant. So in years where again we have cool temperatures 65 to 80 degrees and prolonged periods of dew or, or uh, rainy periods that uh, really makes it conducive for northern corn leaf blight. Management will include the use of resistance. Uh, there are quite a few hybrids out there that have good uh, resistance to northern corn leaf blight. Also rotation, the longer the better here between corn crops and then of course fungicides could be used as well. An occasional disease that we see in Wisconsin would be a uh, gray leaf spot. Uh, this will not be present in every year, but occasionally we do find it along the southern tier of counties in uh, the state of Wisconsin. This is caused by a Cercospora species, Cercospora zeomatis, uh, and yield losses when it does come in can be pretty significant. So I want to take a little time here and talk about gray leaf spot uh, because we can have some pretty substantial yield losses here. Uh, it is a um, uh, pathogen uh, also typically born on um, residue left in the field, so it can be uh, worse in no-till type systems uh, where we have a lot of residue or in uh, fields where we have very tight rotations between our uh, corn uh, crops. Okay? Now heat typically favors uh, uh, this uh, particular pathogen and high humidity. So in years when it's really warm and humid, uh, we'll typically see gray leaf spots. So this is different than northern corn leaf blight, which favors cooler, uh, wetter conditions. Uh, gray leaf spot likes it much warmer. Management here would include rotation, uh, resistance, uh, and then also fungicides here. And you can see the symptoms in these uh, photographs here. Uh, this is a blockier type lesion, uh, which is vein delimited, uh, stuck between the veins, uh, and it typically has very square ends to the lesion. So that makes it much different uh, in terms of the symptoms that we see maybe with northern corn leaf blight. We also have northern corn leaf spot, which can be a problem occasionally in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we do have several different races uh, out there which can cause uh, this disease, although race 3 seems to be the most important. It does cause these narrow linear lesions that range from about an eighth to a quarter inch. Uh, and these lesions can be numerous on a, on a leaf and they can coalesce uh, to form uh, larger lesions. It overwinters in corn residue, uh, so on the husks and stalks and, and those sorts of things. So again, residue management and tillage here could be very important in fields that have uh, continued issues with northern corn leaf, leaf spot. The environment that favors this disease are going to be moderate temperatures, 65 to 80 degrees, and, and very high relative humidity. So again, uh, wetness being a, a big player here with this particular disease as well. Management's going to include rotation, uh, tillage, uh, resistance, and also fungicides. Now we're getting into some stalk rots here. Uh, Gibberella uh, stalk rots, one of the more common ones that we do see occasionally uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, Gibberella zea is the uh, fungus here which causes this type of damage. This is very diagnostic of, of Gibberella stalk rot where we'll actually have compromisation of the uh, stalk here, typically at a node uh, starting out. And then as it progresses it will damage the uh, internal area of the stalk. And a lot of times with this particular disease, we'll get a red or, or purplish uh, to pink colorations uh, from uh, this particular pathogen. And these are byproducts that are produced by the fungus, which cause these, these odd pigmentations, but can be very diagnostic. Disease is typically um, uh, favored by uh, very stressful conditions. So if we have uh, uh, weather conditions which are not conducive for corn growth that can uh, place a lot of stress on the plants and we'll see a higher infection in those years. Uh, also if there's some nutrient lacking that, that can also predispose corn plants uh, to uh, gibberella stalk rot and also high plant populations. So control here would be to uh, take care of some of these stresses and then also use resistant varieties and also crop rotation. Okay, fungicides in this case probably aren't going to uh, give you much advantage here in, in control, so we need to do some planning in, in fields where we've seen uh, gibberell stock rot. Working our way down the plant to the root system, uh, nematodes can be an issue on corn as well, primarily uh, lesion nematode, which is caused by several Pratilancus species. 
the symptoms include uh, some water soaking and also lesions on root systems. So if you're scouting uh, fields with poor growth in certain areas of that field, uh, you might pull up some plants and inspect the root systems. The finer roots, you'll notice a lot of this damage uh, with these black lesions and, and some of that water soaking that goes on there. You'll notice from the top that uh, affected corn uh, plants will often be stunted uh, and maybe even off color again because the root systems have been compromised from the feeding of that uh, nematode. Control includes crop rotation, also variety selection, and uh, sanitation. Uh, again, a, a fungicide spray here, we're dealing with a nematode, not a fungus, so we're not going to be wanting to put any fungicides on for this situation. We need to have good records in a particular field and do some planning prior to the crop going in the ground uh, if we're trying to manage lesion nematode. Uh, also on corn, we can have a, a suite of diseases which can cause uh, ear rots uh, on corn, and so you can see some examples here. Uh, we, of course, worry about uh, ear rots compromising uh, uh, not only uh, yield, uh, but they can also, in certain cases, produce toxins called mycotoxins, which can be detrimental to uh, uh, animals and also humans. And so we're, we're interested in controlling these diseases not only from a yield standpoint, but to control that toxin. One of the more common ones that we see in Wisconsin is going to be uh, fusarium ear rot, uh, which can be caused by various fusarium species. Uh, symptoms can be variable uh, depending on the hybrid we're using or the fungus that's actually doing the damage here, but you can see uh, uh, a lot of the, the type of damage that we get. It can be localized to begin with and then moves outward uh, and can move all the way down the, um, the uh, ear in some cases, especially if we've had some damage on that ear, maybe from hail or something like that. Uh, so a lot of times we'll see individual kernels being affected and then more kernels as it progresses. And with fusariums, we also get this sort of white, uh, white to pinkish uh, coloration with the mycelium as it's growing out. So if you see that kind of growth, that can be very diagnostic. And growth, again, is frequently associated with physical damage. So again, fields would have had some hail damage. Uh, we oftentimes see more uh, fusarium ear rot in those particular fields. One that we don't see much at, uh, uh, at all in Wisconsin, uh, it's very infrequent but can occur in some years, uh, uh, is aspergillus ear rot. And so in years that we, it's very hot and very dry uh, in Wisconsin, we can, we can see this particular disease. Again, it's probably a 1 in 10 year um, uh, situation, but we should be aware of this because this is a very uh, important pathogen. Uh, and can be uh, produce a lot of uh, really important uh, mycotoxins when it is present. And this can be caused by um, uh, several Aspergillus species, mostly Aspergillus flavus, but also Aspergillus parasiticus can be involved here. Uh, you can see the uh, kernels will be uh, often damaged, and sometimes we get this sort of drab green growth uh, and sporulation, which results from uh, the infection and progression of that uh, fungus through the, the uh, kernel. Uh, sporulation is uh, mostly evident on damaged kernels, so in years where it's really hot and dry, we get uh, damage that, that occurs uh, on those plants, maybe from those stressful conditions, and that can promote this type of disease. And aspergillus loves the heat, and so the hotter it is, the more conducive it is for this particular pathogen. One that we see also uh, probably not as common as fusarium ear rot, but we do see it on occasion is penicillium ear rot. Uh, infections typically occur where uh, e the ears are again damaged. Uh, it produces this sort of powdery green or blue fungal growth, which is much different than that uh, produced by uh, aspergillus. And it is most often at the tips of ears where we see this one uh, progress. And it can be an issue in, in grain stored at high moisture. So if we take some grain out that's um, you know in the 20% range, uh, we put that in storage and we don't do any drying on that, uh, we can see uh, some of this um, uh, fungus continue to grow in that uh, grain. In silage, we can also see uh, penicillium uh, grow. So if we're not storing silage correctly, uh, that can also be an issue uh, in, in stored uh, silage there. So the reason why I bring these ear rots up and we, we talk about these not only from the uh, grain damage standpoint, but also we have mycotoxins which cause uh, 
uh, can cause uh, tremendous issues in, in humans and animals. Uh, these mycotoxins are toxic uh, metabolic byproducts produced by fungi. Uh, the, uh, there are about four to 500 known mycotoxins out there and the production of mycotoxins is highly dependent on the environment and, and other factors such as hail damage and some of those things that we see. Also, kernel moisture is very important. So, uh, if again, if we're harvesting high moisture corn, uh, there's some issues there. If there's already infection in ear molds present in that corn, we need to be aware of that because we want to get some of that moisture out of that corn or these these uh, uh, molds will continue to grow and the toxins will continue to be produced in the storage process. Okay, so storing is very important and in inspecting that uh, grain or silage as it goes into the storage um, uh, uh, bins is, is important in, in, in terms of controlling mycotoxin. Now, the presence of mold on certain ears does not always equal mycotoxins being there and vice versa. So we can have uh, uh, no mold but also mycotoxins being produced. So testing uh, in fields that maybe uh, we know might have some uh, ear rot is going to be very important to see what the levels of mycotoxin are in those uh, either that grain or in that silage. Now we do have our pest management uh, uh, in, in Wisconsin field crop series and there is a list of laboratories you can test uh, for samples or test samples of mycotoxin out there. Uh, this is a good idea especially if you think you've had some infection or, or found some ear rot it's always good to uh, test that uh, sample for mycotoxin so you can contact those laboratories and have that done. Uh, the fusarium mycotoxins are probably the ones that we see most widely. Again, fusarium ear rot is going to be more common in Wisconsin than some of the other ear rots here. So deoxynevalanol or vomitoxin or DON as we sometimes call it uh, is going to be the one that we are mostly uh, concerned with here in the state. Aflatoxin can be occasionally a problem, but very, very rare in Wisconsin, again, because aspergillus uh, growth on, on ears is going to be uh, pretty rare in the state as well. Uh, now, in, in 2012, we did have some issues with aflatoxin. So uh, if you remember that year, it was very hot, uh, very dry. Uh, drought uh, prevailed in the state and probably one of the most challenging growing years that we had had uh, in Wisconsin. And we did find uh, some samples in uh, corn grain. Uh, Dairyland Laboratories did report some samples uh, that were uh, uh, above uh, thresholds for um, uh, uh, corn uh, silage uh, greater than 20 parts per billion in the state. So again, occasional, but can uh, be here. And the reason why we're interested in, in watching out for this is because it is very carcinogenic and it takes very low levels, uh, 20 parts per billion uh, for corn use for, for feed before we start to see uh, pretty significant issues in terms of safety there. Fusarium ear rots, um, uh, what we probably see more uh, common, the vomitoxins and fumonisins, those have a, a higher uh, threshold in terms of, of uh, corn use for human consumption or for uh, feed for horses or poultry or cattle. Now we're looking at somewhere between two and, and uh, maybe five parts per million if we're looking at cattle here uh, in the state. Uh, but we do find it, so, you know, some samples from one year to the next with some uh, uh, fumonisin in them. So we need to be aware of this. Again, testing is very important. In terms of management for these various uh, mycotoxins and ear rots, uh, again, stress is probably one of the biggest predisposers of these two are uh, this group of diseases uh, in the state. So we need to make sure we're managing soil fertility and those sorts of things, choosing the right hybrids for our location so that they're not stressed uh, in that particular field. Um, uh, making sure we're supplying any irrigation if we need to uh, in fields that might have uh, issues there uh, from one year to the next with water. Uh, minimizing insect damage, harvesting in a timely manner, uh, and then also trying to minimize any kernel damage at harvest by uh, getting our combine set properly. Also, if there's uh, fields where we know we've seen some mold or we suspect there could be some uh, ear rot issues, uh, we're going to want to make sure that we dry that corn down properly. 
Um, if you if you read the literature, somewhere in the third, 12 to 13 percent range is going to be uh, where we want to shoot in terms of storage uh, to reduce the continued growth of those uh, fungi in the uh, in the storage environment. And again, good storage cleaning can also help uh, keep keep uh, things like penicillium down to a minimum. With that, uh, if you have any further questions on what I've talked about today, uh, you can feel free to call me uh, at my phone number here, or uh, here's my email address, and we also have a website available where we uh, post quite a bit of information as well uh, as, well as uh, research summaries. Uh, you can also always uh, contact your local extension agent.